All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, Here we go again. <laughs> we're excited to go through these wines with you guys. Um, again, uh, make sure you're you're on the mute on your end so uh, we can hear you and everybody else can can uh, hear us. I guess. Um, and if they have questions, they can send it to you. And Jill says that she is ready for your questions in the chat. So uh, if you've got questions for us, uh, Jill's here um, and managing the, the chat, and she can uh, fire those at us and, and uh, get your questions answered. So. Um, uh, we're going to get started, and uh, we're going to start with the Forest de Flor. I know uh, <clears throat> on this shipment, we had uh, the mixed group. If you have a mixed club shipment, you got a bottle of the 19 Forest de Flor. Um, and then uh, as after we do that one, we'll, we'll move into the rest are all red. So if you're in the red group, uh, you can uh, warm up with the, with the Zephyr while we're talking about the, the Force, or um, uh, maybe you'll change your mind and you want a bottle of Force. So, uh, Anyways, we're going to get started. Uh, 2019 Force, uh, Kendon. Um, uh, so excited about this one. Well, the, uh, Viognier is an outspoken character. Viognier is uh, quite what I call a violent, particularly in the uh, the nose and the aroma and bouquet. It's just uh, somewhat overpowering. So I'm really pleased with Eric on this one. We went down to 20% Viognier. But we also added a uh, grape, which has come into a little bit of notoriety here, although there's still very little planted in the area. It's a grape that actually originated in Spain, but it has been kind of taken over. And now it's called what's called a Royal Rhone. It is one of the accredited Rhone grapes. There's actually a Peak Pool Blanc, which is this one. And there's a Peak Pool Noir. Both are Chateau de Pop clones that are both accredited. And you know um, what uh, Peak Pool Blanc? Yes, I do. Cool, actually. Thank, thank you for asking. Cool, actually. And it means lip stinger in French. Right. Um, it is used for its acidity development in wines. And that's why it goes perfectly with this Viognier. And then Grenache Blanc is somewhat acidic and has the nice citrus tones to it and kind of lifts up uh, the whole uh, thing. Um, undoubtedly, Eric, this is the best Forest de Fleurs we've made thank to you. date. Um, it's the one that I've been waiting to make. I think uh, when, before I found the Pit Pool Blanc, uh, I was using the Grenache Blanc and the Viognier and, and, and kind of playing around with different um, blends on that and varying degrees of Viognier and Viognier being uh, what it is, as Kim been described, it, it is very overpowering. And, and uh, you know, even 20% in the wine, you, you taste it, sometimes even down like in the Zephyr, we were down, uh, you know, 5% and you're still yeah. picking up on it. So, um, it just has that quality, and and um, if you if you want that in your blend, then then you put more in. But it doesn't take over long. It really is. Uh, it really is. And what what you strong. get from this particular blend is you're going to get a lot of pineapple and honey pear and those kind of uh, forward fruit items. But then you finish by the second and the third sip, you're going to get a very nice uh, acidic finish. So it's very pleasing. It's pleasurable to the senses, but it's also um, really refreshing. I really like to serve this one very cold, um, almost refrigerator temperature cold, um, not wine fridge temp cold, uh, 41 degrees, uh, 45 degrees, somewhere in that range, um, you know, because it's just really refreshing. Um, I always joke, and when people come in and they start with this, and then uh, this is a good one to take the road dust off your teeth, you know, it's just a really nice. Um, it's just a really nice opener to our tasting menu. So I've been really, really pleased with this one. Everybody's loved it. Now we're drinking it at cellar temp, which is um, uh, 58, 58 degrees. So, 58. Um, and, it, and at that temperature, uh, it, it does have a, a little more of a melon, I think, to it. Uh, yeah. Not so much on the, that kind of goes away as you chill it. But um, uh, I get more of a melon. It almost tastes, uh, people, yeah, people say uh, it, it tastes sweeter. And, um, and I get that a lot. And it's, it's not sweet. There's no sugar in this wine. It's uh, completely dry. And uh, it's just the, 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 the fruit in those grapes. And uh, especially the Viognier kind of gives you that, that uh, coach your tongue and makes it feel, feel sweet. And that, that is, by the way, why Viognier and Lausanne particularly are the two white grapes that are used for blending because they have a nice texture. So we like Viognier because it's got a nice roundness and it's got a little bit more viscosity to it than a lot of the other white juices. So here's a, a bit of history for you. 
Um, I, uh, I, Do tell. Okay. <laughs> uh, the Forest de Fleur kind of uh, evolved from a wine that I made, and some of you may be around long enough to know or remember the ZC White. So I had a uh, pair, ZC White and ZC Red, which we produced uh, mostly for the restaurants and by the glass, but we but uh, we did sell it here at the winery, and it was a um, Grenache Blanc, Marsan Russe. And then uh, I lost the I lost the vineyard. It was uh, it was a I forget it was like a probably 2011. It was a really it was short one year, of our and uh, passed away yeah. this year, um, last year. And um, uh, it was a short year, and the, the vineyard uh, just didn't pick out enough fruit for us. So so we were we were left out of that. But we, we went to uh, I think a straight Grenache Blanc from there, and then we picked up a uh, little Viognier. And then over the years, and now it's it's come around. And like I said, I mean, this is the wine, the, the force I've been wanting to make, and is what I had in mind when I, when I came up with this, uh, this the name and the wine uh, blend was was these three wines together. So uh, it's uh, finally got or uh, uh, what I designed actually came into those place. those of you that have have had our previous force to close, this peak pool is totally it's a game changer. Yeah, but which really one is this? Makes it one that I think it helps to balance out that the meal oh, yet. Uh, you know, Grenache Blanc does have a, uh, you know, a very crisp uh, character to it, but the Pixel Blanc is, is uh, you know, probably another magnitude above that. So, uh, yeah, it really is a nice. I nice think you'll all wine. agree it's a beautiful white wine. And uh, Force de Flore. So, uh, it's got lots of uh, floral characteristics, uh, very fruity, uh, well balanced, um, and uh, really refreshing. I actually drink this uh, quite often, take a bottle home and, and uh, chill it. Yeah, especially when the weather's nice. I don't know what it's like where you guys are, but it's 80 degrees here and it's beautiful. And uh, great, great day for uh, enjoying a bottle of light wine. What do you think? Okay, I'm gonna to go to Zephyr. All right, you guys, uh, we're gonna move on to Zephyr. And uh, <coughs> Zephyr uh, has a little bit of Viognier in it as well, but it's uh, it's it's co-fermented. So uh, it's a blend of Syrah, uh, a little bit of Zin, and Viognier, which we co-ferment. And if you're not familiar with co-ferment, uh, when we bring in the Syrah, we also pick the Viognier, and they're come, they come from the same vineyard in El Pomar. And uh, we bring them in uh, at the same time and ferment them together in the same tank. Uh, and it's, it's basically just shoveled in. We destem them both and I kind of uh, we, we weigh them out so I know the percentages. And uh, just kind of shovel them in at the harvester and put them in the tank and let them ferment together. And there's a, there is a, uh, uh, you know, just a marriage of flavors and, and uh, things that happen in that tank that you can't get if you were to just uh, blend those. Uh, juices together or those wines together at a later date. Um, there's, there's just a, a marrying of uh, uh, tannins and anthocyanins with uh, the, the Viognier actually uh, helps to increase the color. Um, and this is a classic technique that uh, the French can use. Right. Long time. This is in the style of what is called Cote Routi, the northernmost Rhone province. And that, the last thing that Eric said, the interesting thing about this is there is an enzyme in Viognier that actually is a color enhancing enzyme for the red wine. So go figure that out. But that's what happened in the early, the British were driving the red wine market um, for, the, for, the, for the French. And they were the largest consumers back 300 or so years ago. So when the French in the Syrah and the Rhone Valley discovered that there's this, this enzyme that can actually enhance the and darken the color of Syrah because they were basically competing for the Bordeaux market. And me being from the, the British Isles myself, being the Kenton, Welsh Kenton, um, I can say this, the British are quite stodgy and I don't mean to offend anybody, but they would prejudge the wine by the, the relative worth of it by the darkness. Of it. Well, I think that's still going on today. And somewhat it does, yeah. people judge. I mean, I get people out here all the time. Yes, it's not dark. Lee, the question. Uh, how do you determine what percentage of each grape that you co-ferment together? 
Um, well, I'm, I'm kind of going on uh, the classic. So uh, typically the, um, in the Coro T, you've got uh, maybe a field blend. Uh, these vines are interplanted. The viognier is interplanted with the Syrah. And uh, they just go through and, and pick it all. And it's, uh, it's, it's roughly you know, anywhere from three to 5%. So I, I try to stay within that, uh, in, in, into that into those bracket there. And, and uh, I, you know, again, with Viognier, you put, you put more, I feel like more than 5%, it's gonna be too much. And you're gonna, it's gonna interfere with, with, what, with all the other things that are going on with the wine, the fruit and the Syrah and the Zin together. Those, those two, it's an interesting, um, uh, phenomenon that those two grapes uh, they work together really well. And just to clarify, yeah. that co fermentation is um, it's I call it it's a reverse, it's just the opposite of a blend. It's basically blended before it goes in the barrel for 18, 15, 18 years. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. You think about why would a white wine grape going into a red grape and make it dark? And it's it's all in the chemistry. Basically, that these anthocyanins are uh, typically chaining up, and the anthocyanins are the red pigment. In the wine, so the Viognier actually enhances that ability for those anthocyanins to chain up and makes them more permanent. And that way, when you ferment your wine, um, you don't lose lose some of that. And that, that happens over time. So you probably all, uh, if you've had an, an older bottle of wine that you um, kept in your cellar and you open it, and there's there's a bunch of stuff at the bottom. A lot of that is um, some of the the, the anthocyanins that, that have fallen out either. Mercaric acid, but it's, it's kind of a, a reddish, uh, purplish kind of stuff at the bottom of your bottle. And that happens over time. The Viognier helps us uh, chain up and uh, be more prevalent. So it, in essence, makes your wine darker for a longer period of time. So. Sorry, this Zephyr is lovely. And you know, you guys realize the Zephyr is named after this cooling westerly winds that come through our property every day. In uh, France, they call it Mistral. And lots of times in, in Spain, they'll call it Mariah, um, but it's always the west wind. Um, and the west wind is prevalent on this temperate and gap property. Um, it is what really allows us to have a longer growing season. It dramatically cools the vineyard down in the afternoons, um, pretty dramatically. I mean, uh, even today, it's blowing pretty good out there. Um, you can have a jacket on here. I mean, we've gone to town for, for dinner and, and uh, you know, but put sweatshirts on or jackets and we get to town and take them off because it's that it's that much of a difference and we're only going five miles so it's it's just uh, the matter of the way the hills are the way the wind blows through and uh, really through the gap the, the templeton gap and that's why they call it the gap it's just it's a channel and there's a, a venturi effect that sucks the especially when it's warm in the valley here uh, sucks that cool air from the from the ocean straight through the gap and uh, it, you just happen to be sitting right in there in that zone, so we benefit. And uh, our <laughs> the fact that we don't have umbrellas here at the winery, um, I should testify that uh, we, <laughs> yeah. we can't do that. We can't do that. That's true. Yeah, no, no shade umbrellas. No shade umbrellas. No, but uh, this is lovely. This is the five percent. Now I've been part of this team now here at Zenata for going on eight years, but um, one year it went to seven percent, and then Eric is shared with three, five, or seven typically is where we're at. Mm -hmm. And we've tasted a few, it usually ends up to be 5%. Um, the thing about this wine is it's got, the, it's got that nice smokiness from Syrah. And then it has that mouth feel, that Viognier, it's a little bit thicker juice like we mentioned previously. Viognier and Rassan are used for that purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so it gives you a really beautiful tongue swirl. Um, it's just a, on a mass spectrometer on a density meter, probably would be, you know, a degree or two thicker. Yeah, we actually, we actually do that. I get yeah. those numbers. They're like 99. And that sign is still here. It's like any thicker, it'd be like a black curtain. Yeah. So uh, anthocyanins are in the skin, is that correct? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's for the, the, like, you squish a grape and the insides, most grapes, there are some grapes that have no juice, but, um, most wine grapes, uh, ones we're talking about here, have clear juice, and that's why we macerate the the, the wines and when we ferment them, and all we're trying to uh, leach out that color and uh, have those anthocyanins chain up and, and be permanent in our in our wine. So um, uh, it all comes from the skin, yeah. And you know, tannin uh, comes from the skin, uh, a little bit from the seeds, a little bit from the stem, 
and uh, but uh, the juice is all about the fruit and the, the, the floral and, and all the good, all the pretty stuff. Um, we should probably talk a little about about 2018 in general as a vintage. Um, it was a big year. 2018, uh, we had a big winter, uh, wet spring, and uh, we we were. I was very worried about uh, holding the rains back on the vineyard. And we're still reaping the benefits of the major rain event, which is the winter of 16 to 17 August. So the, the soils were leached of all their <laughs> The salts and alkaline throughout the drought years, that was all leached out of the soil, out of the topsoil. So the vineyards were really receptive to any water. And that's what we see in 18, is we didn't get as much rain, but the soil was totally able, the plants were totally able to utilize whatever water we did get. So it was a really good harvest. I think we're going to see. Yeah, big, um, big crop. This even, was, even, even with our fruit thing, we typically fruit thin uh, down to two. Two tons per acre, which is about one cluster for every little um, shoot out there, and um, uh, we we did that, and the punches were just heavier. They were just more dense. So even with us going through and and uh, you know me being worried about overcropping and the wine quality going down, went through there and and uh, took everything down, and it was just uh, uh, heavier punches. So we ended up with sometimes um, uh, twice as much fruit. Which, which is bizarre, but it's, uh, it was all really high quality. And um, I love when that stuff. happens. Yeah. Because <laughs> really, basically, what he's describing is well, basically all of the native wines with the amount of fruit drop that Eric does and just utilizing the best product is it's really all reserved. I mean, that's really what the definition of reserve is. I mean, it's best practice, but it's the best fruit. So, I mean, all of Zeta wines, as you see how palatable and pleasurable they are, that is. Uh, a reflection of the quality of fruit that we use, but we could probably squeak out another two or three thousand cases if we used what we harvest, what we could harvest. Oh, easily, easily, yeah. But it's it, it wouldn't be nearly as, as no. uh, uh, intense. The fruit yeah, the doesn't, doesn't uh, <laughs> just doesn't taste. Um, uh, as, as far as the fruit for this uh, this wine, um, the Syrah comes from the Syrah and the Viognier come from the Carriage Room. Which is uh, in the Elk Mar district. That's the uh, east side of Templeton. Um, just basically a straight shot from we, where we are east. And um, the Zin is our state Zin. Um, I, I love Zin and Syrah together. I think that those two uh, are, I don't know if you find many out there, they, they might all come from Paso. There's a, there's a handful of us uh, buddies of mine that I know do it. And uh, they just, they, there's a, there, there's something that works between those two varieties. When you uh, blend Syrah and Zen, I think the, the fruitiness of the Zen uh, really works well with the earthiness of the Syrah, helps to lift the fruit and the smokiness and then the smoking. savoriness of the Zen. Yeah, it's a match made in heaven. You'll notice at the tasting room when I visit with you guys, when you come in, um, I usually follow the Zen with the Syrah because I think they really flavor zones really uh, pair, you know, pair into each other so well. Yeah. I tend to get a lot of blackberry, raspberry, you can uh, get a little lavender. Well, the, that's what I think is so pleasant about that, our Syrah, that lavender. That's kind of what started me on my wine journey was I had a sip of the Syrah. Lavender, and then the smoked meats on the next sip. It's just, a, I call it the ethereal grape in case uh, because it really is a thought provoker, you know. Just like, what the hell was that? What the hell was that? <laughs> it is. It is a. Uh, I would say it's a, a California blend, um, uh, and it, you know, it's just three grapes that you wouldn't normally see together. Uh, I think in Paso you will, and um, uh, it, it just. I, I I tend to blend things that taste good. Uh, I mean, I want things to taste good. That's that was the whole reason behind the, the, the blending of the wines to make. You know, that's your end result. I want it to taste good. So, uh, and they, they work. And since I know Barbara and I are out there, well, hi, Barbara Spangler. I'm out here. <laughs> hey, John. Um, this is one that's a different one to pair with food. Um, I think maybe it is because of some of those Viognier aspects, but also the lavender we've mentioned. I really like this with just a charcuterie plate or something like that, which can bring out the smokiness and the Syrah and also the, the savoriness and the Zen. 
but, um, or you could go with either a lamb sort of dish or something like that, um, or even sausages of some sort. But um, as far yeah. as cheese, the, the dry yeah. actually like the yeah. manchego, like uh, the uh, or or sage, 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 really, uh, really yeah. makes uh, changes and brings out more of that uh, saginess or the, right. uh, the yeah, the sage is smoke. The sage is a good spice. That's a good one. Yeah. So now we're going to go to my pride and joy. My mom used to dance around the house calling me Kenny Boy, my pride and joy. <laughs> and so I call <laughs> Zen, my, Zen is my pride and joy. I got a um, weird, I got a weird vision in my head. <laughs> That's my mom. Yeah. My mom's All right, yeah, stay Zen. Yeah. So uh, 2018 Zen, and Ken Ben asked me, uh, well, before the meeting started, I'd accidentally opened a 17, and I uh, had it up here, and we were tasting it, and, and uh, he asked me what, what I thought the differences between the two were. And, you know, I mean, the, the biggest difference, I said the biggest difference to me is that I can actually read the label, because uh, in 18, we changed uh, the, the writing. <laughs> So we're always having a hard time. Stuff. We're all challenged. My eyes are, are, are yeah. you know, as I age, my eyes are aging as well, and, and I couldn't read the bottle. So uh, all the all the uh, varietal manager wanted to wait, but um, in eighteen. But uh, I think uh, in essence, between the two wines, um, you know, obviously you have the differences in the age, and you have a year, you have a year in the bottle um, uh, difference, but the. The intensity of the fruit in 18 to me was uh it is more pre prevalent i mm -hmm. think in the 18. yeah 17 massive. is is uh really like pretty lovely right now i mean it's it's uh almost it's the, the, the seven the 17 is in is at the perfect time in its life cycle yeah and, and, and i'm going to say something <laughs> here it's, <laughs> it's just about gone um note to self if you guys want any of that um it'll be gone next week so, um, it, but the 17 Zen is, it's, it's, it's my, be still my heart on that one. That's a really, really nice one. Now, I think this is going to be the same that Eric and I were going over. I think it's going to be a little it's, more intense uh, maybe, as time goes by. I think the, uh, um, the, the, depth, the depth of that fruit is, and, is just a little bit more. Yeah. I, I, so we'll see what happens. But, and Zen is, is a tough one. I mean, you have, uh, um, I'm sure you've all had Zinfandels where like, I, I call them over the top, but they it's more like a pork. So you have these wines that are, uh, Zinfandel tends to ripen and get these extraordinarily high brick numbers. And you pick them and, and half the cluster is at 30 bricks and the other half is at yeah, very 25. Uneven, very and, uneven ripening. And then it, it soaks up. So you, you, once you bring it into the winery and you process all that fruit and put it together, it starts to macerate the sugar in some of those higher percentage of the raisins basically. Uh, pump up the juice and all the sugar is released and all of a sudden you've got this in that is just a monster. It's over the top. You're not going to be able to, to ferment it to dry. It's going to have uh, residual sugar. It's going to be, it's going to taste like pork. So I don't want my Zen to be a pork. I want to, I want you guys to, to see uh, why Zen is, is, uh, should be a, you know, a, a on the, on the same level as Cabernet and, and uh, you know, the noble, the noble varietals. Some people look down on this one, but it's, I think it's, uh, if you make it uh, in a style where you're emphasizing the fruit, you're not picking it too ripe. I mean, you get this right. I mean, the alcohol on this is pretty high. It's like six, close to 16. So um, it's a full body wine, uh, but it's, it's, that alcohol is hidden. It is, it really is it's fun, really uh, below the surface. It's a, it's kind of a sneaker. And, um, but it's all, for me, I want to taste the fruit. I want it to be fresh, but I also want that full body. That's, that's why I, I try to get it just to the point where it's like, okay, any farther and it's too much. And then we, we pull out all the raisins and, and make the wine, which and is, which is easy if you have the right machine. And I think it does, it is probably, as I watch the process, it's probably a little bit more labor intensive. Zinfandel has a, has a, bad habit of right before you're going to harvest and you're starting to see the overripe fruit like Eric mentioned in these incomplete ripening clusters, you're going to get a secondary growth. So you get these little hard green berries in there throughout we, the cluster. We, we take those out too. I know, you have to get those out too. So there's a lot of sorting. Um, it seems like there's a lot more um, labor involved with at least our primitivos in which uh, 
you talk about uh, Primitivo. Um, Primitivo is a clone of, of Zinfandel. Sometimes you see Primitivo just on the bottle and they don't mark it or label it as uh, Zinfandel, but it is it is Zinfandel. Primitivo is a clone of, of uh, it's, it's just slightly different in its growth habit. And yeah, that's it, what it we looks different in. anatomically. Um, kind of but it wasn't until, in, as I've told a lot of guys, it was in 2002 that Michael Gurgich of uh, Gurgich Hills fame, and also in the movie Bottle Shock, he was at the time the uh, famous red wine maker. Um, the Bottle Shock movie, 1976, Judgment of Paris. Um, they, they found some ancient vines in Croatia along the Dalmatian coast, and there were maybe only six vines left. And he said, I believe that's Zinfandel. And they did DNA testing. And discovered in 2002 that Zin is actually uh, descended from that, those vines that they found there, which is called Krzelnak Kostolansky. So um, that is uh, Zinfandel and Primitivo are not totally synonymous. I mean, they're not identical genetically. They are. They're real close. No picture is now. 95, 96%. If there was a crime committed, I think that's no, they just have to have this. If you guys could please make sure you're muted, there's two of you that are not muted, and it's causing some feedback on our end. So please check that your little microphone is red. I've sent you both individual messages. Thank you. <laughs> so anyway, Zen is a uh, Zen is an underappreciated, elegant, elegant beautiful wine when it's made correctly. Um, I can- Our favorite this, uh, descriptor of the, of the, that weird, not weird, I guess it's a, it's a very distinct and unique characteristic of Zin. It's the, it's the, uh, the briar, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Brambling. 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 So, um, <laughs> uh, Zinfandel, and I think part of the reason why we have this Bramble, and, and uh, I, I know from, from, uh, growing this grape and, and tasting this as it's growing and, and processing this fruit, uh, this, the, the, the clusters of Zinfandel, when they're being processed, uh, they're very fragile. So as you put them through the stemmer, they break, the cluster will break apart and you get the main stem will come out, but little, you get these little jacks and uh, they're still connected to the berries. And a lot of that is sorted out, but um, uh, you know, a fair amount still makes it into the wine and, or into the fermenter. And it, that, if you were to pick up and chew on those little bits, they have that bramble, that, that so there's a stemminess to it, which, exactly. which adds um, a really unique characteristic to the wine. Right. And it's, it's almost like whole cluster. It's desirable, you want that. You don't yeah, want you too much of it. It's, no. like, it's like pepper or salt. I mean, you want a little bit of that, it adds to it, but- um, You guys, you know on table grapes, that little nib, I call it, Eric calls it a blessing. A jack. A That's jack. what it looks like. It, nobody plays jacks. Yeah, the, but that, that you little, did. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it looks like. Except yeah, the that connects to the main stem. You, you can't get rid of all that in Zinfandel. So you end up with some of that in the processing, and it adds this really nice savoriness to it. I had a master psalm in here. I had just come back from traveling, and I, the girls came running out and said, Kim, I'm glad you're here. Um, Fred Swan is in there and wants to have a private tasting. And I was kind of like shell shocked because I mean, Fred Swan is like a master song and he's like, he now teaches enology, or, uh, enology and viticulture and wine business at the University of San Francisco. So he's a really preeminent song. And he says that he took this, this into his glass to his nose and he goes, oh, you achieved a really brambly effect here. And I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, yeah, like that. I, I came running back, I, like, I, I just kind of just like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> so I went back into all my books and I finally found that. And I came in and talked to Eric about it. And that's what he described is you can't get rid of those little nibs or jacks from this, the, the uh, sorting. And so you end up with this yeah. really nice, uh, stickier basisness is what I call it out in Sticky or baseness, it's more brambleiness. Um, it's a good thing. I mean, it's it, like I said, it's desirable. You want it, and um, in Zinfandel, it's just it's part of its characteristic, and it's it's unique. Uh, you don't really pick that up in in many other wines. I think Cabernet is is similar, but the, the stemminess in Cab is 
is uh, a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's more on the, the level, I think, of, of green olive. And, uh, and in some cases, it's more, a little more uh, toasty. But, uh, anyway, should we move anyway, on? I hope you love this in as much as we do. I'm going to finish. They say it, it's delicious, and they are excited to see how they do. Yeah, I am too. I am too. Yeah. Um, so this is the second time that they've received the 18th mm -hmm. band of the shipment. They got it in November, and then they got it this time. And so this will be the last time we're sending it out of shipment, but it'll still be available yeah. at the Tasty Room and online. So it is gone. I mean, it's, it's, it's not it's, it's not gone. We're just not sending it out in any more shipments. We don't have enough of that. Okay, getting low. Yeah. All right. So uh, forty six and buying. Um, <laughs> this is uh, probably new to some of you, and uh, it uh, it well we we had the ZC Red. We've rebranded it. We've given it the name it deserves. I think. Um, I can I can I say something about that? Because you know, out, out of the taste room again, I've got nicknames for all these wines, but um, I've always called ZC Red the ultimate overachiever because it was just too damn good for just an Ada Seller Red. It's just it outgrew its own self. So. Eric and Jill decided to come up with this cute name, kind of reminiscent of Hollywood and Vine. I don't think that would look at Vine. A, a lot of little my bit. customers have been saying that. Yeah. That's really cute. It's part of the inspiration for but sure. You realize Vine Street Fronts is only a mile from us, and then we're on 46, so it's geographical somewhat. But, and we have um, Vines. And yeah, we have and Vines. vines. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we have Vine Street. So, but, uh, yeah. in our winery is, you know, on 46, Vine Street is the next crossroad down. Uh, but, but really what I was thinking when I, when I uh, thought of this name was, um, these are the wines that come, these are the grapes that come from the hills that are in Paso. It's a, uh, a blend of, of wines up and down Highway 46. And um, uh, so the, they're the vines of 46. And it's, it's a kind of, it does mix in with the Hollywood wine, but, uh, um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of cool. So it's a passive, passive region. So it's nice to have. <laughs> Here's to the old CC Red. Cheers. Long may you run. This uh, this is um, along the same lines. It's the same configuration. Eric and I were talking about that earlier um, as the CC Red was. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's got its name. It just seems a little bit richer to me. See, it's working. I know it's working. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, I felt like it was, uh, you know, a little bit like the redhead stepchild. It needed, a, it needed its, uh, its own name, it was a little too generic for what it was. It, it's a great wine. I love this wine. It's dark, it's rich, it's flavorful. And um, it, uh, the only thing it doesn't have is all the new oak that, that I, I buy specific barrels for each one of these red wines. This is the, this is the, uh, the wine that comes from uh, the, the barrels after we've turned them on the last ones. We keep barrels uh, for uh, three vintages. Uh, on the third vintage, uh, those barrels are, are considered neutral. There's nothing wrong with them. They, they function just as well as everything else, but they're not in, imparting any oak flavor into the wines. And so we consider them neutral. It's a neutral container. And just um, to comment on that, I mean, Eric's neutral oak is better than most wineries are using for their first line wines. <laughs> I mean, I've never seen a winery that only uses barrels twice and the third time becomes neutral. Um, I think it's mostly, mostly a reflection on that he uses high quality barrels that are really kind of tight grained. And they're, so there's less, there's less oak flavors that come out. Well, it's they're, they're more a tight, a finer grain or a tighter grain barrel is considered a longer aging barrel. So it's a barrel that you want to put your wine in and age it for uh, up to two years. Um, and we, we're aging about 18 months for a lot of our wines. And um, uh, so you don't want to overpower. And I don't, that oak isn't a big part of my program. I like the toastiness. I like what barrels, new barrels do to wines. Um, but I don't want it to be the, the only thing that you get when you get that bottle of wine, you're like, oh my God, that's a lumber yard. Or that just tastes like oak to me or a barbecue. And there's so much more in wine that, that needs to be explored and tasted. And you don't want to just slam it with a bunch of oak. So um, when you come to 46 and Vine, this is the this is the wine that's made exactly like the rest of my wines. They're 
the process the same, the same care, uh, carbonic maceration, cold fermentations, uh, you know, over long periods of time, uh, a lot of care goes into this one. They only, they're aged barrels that are neutral. So in essence, that saves us uh, a little bit of money and we can pass that on in the, it's reflected in the price of this wine. And it's not that it's a, it's a cheap wine. It's, it is just, it doesn't have the same um, expense as the rest of them. So um, you're benefiting uh, by, by me not using new oak on it. That's, that, those are straightforward varietals blended together um, and uh, you know, showing, showing uh, you know, just as well as, as the cab or the fire sign of the Syrah, just without that extra little bit. Beautifully um, soft, user-friendly, great wine to serve to a large group because everybody's gonna have something nice to say about it. <laughs> I mean, it's just really an easy drinking wine. And that's what it's always intended to be. And uh, a little bit about the fruit. So uh, it's a Petit Syrah, um, Syrah and Cab. The Petit Syrah comes from the Alcamar district. I think that uh, it's just, like I said, a, a straight shot across the east from us. Uh, and then the Syrah and the Cab are from here. So those are our state wines, our state grapes. And uh, that's what goes into this. this uh, it's a 45 Petit, 30 Syrah and 25 Cab. Um, and it's just a good all around, with all around wine. It's, uh, you can't go wrong pairing this with a lot of the No. It's just that it's just out of ribs. You know, I used to always joke that ZC Red is like an everyday red. But that's not it's fair. Bit, yeah, I think it's a little bit. That's not fair. It's better. Yeah. Yeah. It's not spaghetti. No, not even. No. <laughs> it's not. But it is. <laughs> but it is. <laughs> all right. You can't decide. Maybe we'll change the name again. Who knows? I just call it spaghetti red. Oh well, <laughs> back to drawing board. Guys, it's lovely. I, I do like this one a lot. Oh, um, you guys, good, good things. Okay, so um, we're gonna move on to Knucklehead. What are we doing? Yeah, we're, we got twenty some odd minutes. Okay. We're, right. we're in good shape. Okay, Knucklehead always so knucklehead. Deserves, deserves a lot of attention. <laughs> in fact, it demands your attention. I was going to say, attention. Attention. most knuckleheads do. Especially without being aggressive. Is this knucklehead? This is knucklehead, yes. <laughs> All right, so uh, knucklehead is our 100% uh, petite Syrah. And as you can tell, it's, uh, it's petite Syrah has no problem with uh, color. Um, <laughs> it is typically known or has been used as a I call it food coloring, but um, they uh, typically use this grape uh, in the past to color up Cabernet. Um, a lot of there's a lot of Cab in Mountain Valley that has 15% petit straw in it, and uh, I'm not going to tell you which ones, but um, <laughs> just know that you probably drink them on a on a pretty good occasion. So um, it happens, and uh, it's it's for good reason. I mean, I mean this stuff is black. It is really dark. Um, and it's just uh, typically um, very tannic and uh, only used for the food coloring. However, grown under the right conditions and crop thin and uh, allowed to, uh, you know, uh, grow with maybe uh, minimal water and intensify that fruit, you can have a really pretty pizza raw, one that has uh, Characteristics other than being dark and very tannic. Well, um, and I, I would say it's dark, but I mean, I've had petit syrah that's like drinking a glass of wine. Yeah. And it, it's not like that. No. Yeah. We, uh, I, I pick vineyards for this, uh, uh, typically three different petit syrah vineyards. Uh, one of them is a dry farmed uh, vineyard, uh, one of them is a, a typical. Uh, Kind of a VSP like what we have here at the, the winery, which is a um, a vertical shoot positioned, um, lots of sun exposure type of canopy, and then um, uh, let's see what else. There, there actually, I have two two uh, head trim vineyards. So, um, and they each are on different kinds of soils. They each kind of give a little bit different um, quality to the wine. One is very fruity. One is a little more acid. 
And I think one has um, a lot of tannin. So um, on its own, each one of those might be missing something. When you blend them all together, it really makes a nice, uh, well-rounded petit sirah that can stand alone. Eric, Eric earlier said something about what I was just thinking about with this um, is very, I got to, I got to dive on um, but it, at, uh, one of the things that I love about what Eric's wine making style is, is what he's alluded to, it's, it's called, uh, it's a, an elongated temperature controlled fermentation. So he does, an elongated fermentation cycle, which my comment is that most of the time you have an 18 petite Syrah, and I always say to you guys at rotation, I'll say it'll tie your tongue in. An 18 petite Syrah will usually tie your tongue in a knot and choke you with tannins. But his long, long fermentation technique tends to chain the anthocyanins and the tannins together before it even goes in a barrel. So everything is kind of pre-aged before barreling. So yeah. that you already have a very integrated product, is what I say. Um, thank you, Joe. Um, so it's already just really well put together. And then we go 18 months in a barrel. And then by the time we serve it to you out here or you get it in your wine club shipments, it's ready to go. Well, I'm taking a, a brute of a grape. And it, it is kind of like rough around the edges, and I'm and I'm uh, making it like a fine Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we talk about carbonic maceration, and this is basically taking this, the grape off the stem. We don't crush it. Um, it's whole berry. Goes into the fermenter, and then we turn on the, the jacket, the chilling jacket, and we chill it down to 40 degrees, and we just let it sit there. I mean, it's hanging out at 40 degrees for probably three days. Three days. And um, what's happening is it's macerating and the color is being pulled out, extracting the uh, floral aromas, all the pretty notes in that juice is being pulled out and um, it, there, we're not um, uh, adding any uh, of that tannin yet. So a lot of the tannin is extracted uh, when there's alcohol present. So later on in fermentation, when the alcohol is present and we do an extended maceration, it starts to leach out that tannin and it makes that wine even more. So um, we were careful not to extend the maceration too long. We get that color up front before there's alcohol present and that makes it prettier, it makes it rounder and uh, it's more like a, a delicate Pinot Noir. So it's, I, it, it's just, it depends on how you make it. If you, uh, and then we're, you know, we're just gentle with We're basically finessing it. Yeah. Into submission. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, that's good. That's that's uh, that's a good explanation. But we we there's other techniques that we use too. So uh, we're we're using uh, the, the day massage, which is uh, yeah. pumping over no. without the seeds. So a lot of times uh, wineries uh, have big tanks of wine fermenting. They're pumping over, and the, the seeds are being ground up in pumps as it goes through. And it's pumping this uh, wine over to aerate during fermentation, and those seeds are getting ground up, and it's releasing that tannin. And alcohol is present, so you get these really brutish big tannin wines. And uh, we, we use a system where we're pulling the juice off and leaving the seeds behind and then, and then splashing that juice over the top. So uh, no seeds are getting ground up. It's just, we're just dealing with the juice and aerating the juice. So uh, it's, uh, it's a lot more gentle process. So that's how we do it. That's how it has to be done. That's a few things that I didn't know. <laughs> All right. Stick with me. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Everyone. So, right. so um, yeah, questions. Questions, we or we still have a couple more minutes. Any questions about Petit Sirah in general? I mean, I've, I've gone into the history of Petit Sirah with most of you, I'm sure. Um, but uh, if anybody would like to hear that again, I'd be happy to. We have enough time. I have a question. So, uh, uh, have some news about the video. Do you have any questions? No, I don't have any questions right now. Um, if uh, we, we don't have any pictures, but uh, uh, in the last newsletter I talked about our new planting. So uh, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, we, over the winter, we pulled out, um, we have two blocks of Cabernet and uh, we pulled out one of those blocks, about four and a half acres. 
and we're going back in with Grenache and Mauvais. So about uh, uh, two and a half acres of Grenache and an acre uh, of, of Mauvais, and um, it's all going to be head trained. And uh, so we've gone through, we've ripped all the old lines out and we put in the new water system, the drips, we put in the stakes, uh, and we're getting our plants uh, next month. So we have those in the ground and, and have some estate Grenache and Moved uh, by 2025. <laughs> and what did you say about Eric? Yeah, it's going to take a little while, but I'm Eric excited. Was able to pick uh, the clones and everything that he wanted. Yeah. Because um, both those grapes have come of age and now you can get lots of different clone, clone types of both Grenache and Morbid. So you can pretty much now define how you want your vineyard to act. I mean, all these things are very, I mean, I, before I, I mean, I know book smart with wines and I know all that sommelier stuff, but as far as the viticulture of it, there's a lot to it. Um, so you, and winemakers in general in Paso have become so much smarter as we've gone along, realizing microclimates a little bit more and soil profiles and angularity of sun and how you plant and how you want to do head trained and what clones are better for that. And we have so, access to better clones and too. Yeah, we didn't access, have that access. Right, you didn't have that. Right? We had uh, what you, you, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Now we have um, Refined. Um, a lot more clones. Um, we've got uh, uh, some clones that were brought over by um, uh, established wineries that went through the process of quarantines and growing it and uh, you know testing it and now those are available to us and um, I ended up picking a, um, a Spanish clone of Mauvet and a, um, a French clone of, of uh, Grenache uh, 115 which is typically smaller berry more intense flavor and, and uh, so you come in as Grenache or Monastrell? Well it'll yeah, probably come in Monastrell. No, it's a Spanish one. Yeah, that's pretty good. Cool. But, you know, mm -hmm. we'll still call it that. Nobody knows what that is. <laughs> but we're very excited. I'm excited. And uh, if uh, if you happen to visit the winery uh, this summer, uh, you'll see those old vines out there growing. And, and uh, we know that that's good stuff is coming. And you guys are all there. And I know how excited Jill and Eric and I all are. You should see what's going on outside. Um, where you'll be tasting next is going to be so gorgeous. I'm so excited. Um, if you would be so kind, type your questions in if you have any questions. Yeah. Um, type them into the, the chat feature of, of uh, down there. You'll see a little button that we use. But um, yeah, so the, uh, the, the lawn that, that uh, you guys have come to know um, <laughs> out the front is now gone. Uh, it's in a pile down uh, at the bottom of the, the, the way here to come in. But um, we, I think, improved on it. We, we uh, have made separate uh, tasting, I don't know, they call them pots. Uh, they're they, they, yeah, they're, they're like basically garden, like garden food. Seniors. Yeah, so uh, we brought in some big boulders. Uh, we, we formed these little, these little booths, and we're going to have um, seating, private seating areas for each party when you come in, you have six, six separate ones that will be out there. And um, uh, right now we, we're, I think we're gonna start plant, putting plants in this week. So we got all the irrigation in, all the rocks are placed. Um, I'm supposed to put up shade cloth and uh, the plants are coming in. And we're assembling the furniture. Yeah, the new furniture and everything. So yeah, Jill picked out all different <laughs> kinds of different furniture. So each little pot or, or garden seating area. Yeah, totally. Well, some of they are. I mean, yeah. they're, all, they're all going to have a different feel a little bit. So it should be really. I know you guys all like the picnic benches, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the back support. Yeah, as well, as well a little more back support. So I have a question regarding the, the mavet that we're planting. <clears throat> yes. Are, will we have a straight mavet varietal? That's the plan. Yeah, so, like uh, 2020, or no, 2019, we just <laughs> did we get any mavet in that? 2019. Oh, yes. No, yeah. So the, the latest bottling, uh, we just put the two, uh, half of our 2019 vintage in, in the bottle. Uh, basically, anything that comes in the Burgundy bottle. So uh, the Grenache, the Moved, we did do a separate Moved drip. Um, and um, <clears throat> the, the Wallflower is back. 
uh, the 2020, uh, we have a pink as well. So the 2020 pink is back. Um, Which is 50% more bed as well. Yep, 50 50 Grenache Moved. Um, and the plan is to have uh, that's why we planted Moved is, is to have, uh, we don't always have enough of that to go around once we, we uh, make our rose and make our blends for the Wanderlust. Sometimes uh, there's just not enough. So we don't always have, but that's the plan to be able to have enough. Um, uh, I enjoy Moved by itself and on its own, and, and uh, I want to have that available to you guys. So. Um, so yeah, it's gonna. It takes vines three years to produce a crop once they're in the ground. So um, it, it'll. You have to be patient. <laughs> twenty twenty four guys. Yeah. So uh, Don and Mary have a question about: Have you ever considered an amarone multiple press process in bottling? No, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a winemaker. <laughs> I feel like we've had we have had amarones before. I guess maybe I'm just not familiar with the process. I'm not either. Uh, all right, Don and Mary, next well, time you guys are here, you're gonna have to I'll, give us a I'll lesson. go I'll research <laughs> it. I'm a simple farmer. I, I do one I'm like a one trick pony. I do one thing and I do it well. <laughs> Grow grapes, make wine. I say got two things. <laughs> two trick ponies. Yeah. Live, He's live really live. good in a little work. <laughs> yeah, All right, yeah. Sure. I'm glad you guys are. <laughs> Everyone seems to be enjoying the wine right, cool. and people are looking forward to being able to get back here. So um, we're looking forward to having you back here. Yeah. And yeah. we're we we are uh, taking uh, reservations now. So if you if you if it's been a while since you've been out, uh, you will have to make a reservation. But uh, wine club members still get free tasting, so uh, we haven't changed everything. <laughs> and just toward, towards that end is uh you know of course we always had that big member appreciation party in august um for those of you who haven't been reading the your emails um we're now having five distinctly different parties in each weekend in may where we'll buy your lunch and uh you'll visit with us we plan on doing some um, raffle drawings like we would at the big parties we used to have um, we're just being COVID sensitive now still, and we plan on just having smaller groups on the property at any one time. So you will have to definitely make reservations for that because they're filling up very quickly. Every um, Saturday in May. I think every uh, Saturday in May is a different food truck, so you can kind of pick your pleasure there and see when you can get an appointment. Um, so please do that on the zanesellers.com website on the reservations link on the upper right hand corner. And I'm 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 uh, <laughs> I'm enjoying it more. I think that um, you know the big parties are fun, but having uh, people come over the the whole month uh, every weekend, we're allowed to see more of you. More of you are able to come because it is you have a choice of days. I know not all of you can always come on the same day, um, so that's that's nice. So more, I think more of you are more members. Yeah, and, uh, buy parties. I, I want to buy you lunch and I want to give you free stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and I would just say also, in addition to you know, making reservations, um, we, we've got some other things we're going to be adding on soon to your tasting experience. So uh, keep an eye out uh, for uh, emails coming out. Uh, you can find the food truck list on the blog, which is just another little button you can click on for nativesellers.com. Um, and then also follow the social media. If, you are able uh mostly we're on instagram and then we just push those same posts to facebook which i will admit we don't really pay much attention to facebook but uh, instagram we try to stay active on. okay hope you guys got that <laughs> all right thanks everybody anybody else well love you guys always thank you for supporting small business and Zanata in particular we love you all um, it, it's been it's been a rough year but uh we're all smiling Julie Diana says you yep. can't retire for the next two years. So she's not <laughs> sure when she's going to be able to get You're out. You're talking about Ken. <laughs> Ken has been on a three-year plan. I've been on a three-year plan for eight <laughs> years, guys. If it wasn't for you, I'd be gone. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, this will get posted on the, on the website. Um, and if you were a part of the last one, sorry about that. We don't know where that. We thought it was recording, but I don't think it was. So, yeah. all right, guys. All right, thank you. Love you guys. Bye, Bye. guys. Where is that?
recording.